This review has taken a lot longer to come out than I intended, but it has given me a lot of time to think about my experience with this game, and hopefully properly articulate why I think it's a really bad game, based on what I've experienced so far. It's worth laying out how I'm going to do this, since I don't really do normal reviews of games. In fact, as you can tell by the length of this video, this still isn't a normal review. I'll be starting off talking about the story without spoilers, then I'll cover the rest of the main story in a clearly marked and time-coded spoiler section, not that spoilers matter much at this stage. After that, I'll talk about everything else I've seen and experienced with the game. Also, I haven't touched much of the side content. My main focus was the main story, and just in general how it feels to play the game, and deal with many of its systems on a normal run. There may have been some details I've missed, as this isn't an in-depth analysis, but a recounting of an experience. I will be doing a full analysis of this game, but there's no telling how long that will take to make, especially considering I'm working on other projects. It's additionally worth preempting a dismissive type of comment that I'm sure to receive, and that's the idea that I was never going to give this game a real chance, because I hate many of Bethesda's other games. This is a fairly common response when you have a history of being critical of something, regardless of the merits or accuracy of your criticism. Not only did I give this game the benefit of the doubt despite signs from the Direct that gave me a bad impression of what this game was going to be, but for a large part of my playtime on stream, any time I was asked if it was bad prior to certain story events, I'd say that I still haven't had enough time to see if it was good or not. It took me a long time to reach the point of believing this was a bad game. Further, I also have an extreme hatred for the later seasons of Game of Thrones, and especially how that show ended, Disney Star Wars, modern Star Trek, and I believe Netflix has a horrible track record with anime adaptations, such as Death Note or Bebop Flicks, the latter of which I've done a video on, I plan on doing a full breakdown for. Yet, I very much loved House of the Dragon, Andor, Season 3 of Star Trek Picard, and Netflix One Piece. Additionally, I hated Amnesia Rebirth to the point of making a three-hour video on it, and yet, I loved Amnesia the Bunker. I am more than willing to give something a fair chance, despite the hard failings in the series preceding them, and despite any skepticism I might have had of such things being good. My mind is never made up before something is released and I've had a chance to experience it. Had Starfield been a good game, I would have been pleasantly surprised and I'd be singing this game's praises and I'd be eating crow on my doubts. However, today I will not be eating any crow. Unfortunately, what we got turned out to be a shallow, boring mess. In fact, this game is so mind-numbingly fucking boring that scripting and recording this video was a task and a half for me because the mere thought of this game was so goddamn fucking boring that even thinking the word Starfield has the power to invoke drowsiness within me. Even as I write these words into the script and record them for this video, I want nothing more than to get into bed and go the fuck to sleep. With Starfield, Bethesda takes boring and turns it into a goddamn Olympic sport, and the only award this game deserves to win is the most boring game of 2023. There is a big cope going around that the game gets better after you beat the main story. About 15 to 20 hours of gameplay depending on who you ask. It shouldn't take a game 20 hours to get good, and I don't believe that the writing quality magically improves after being the main story, and the gameplay sure as fuck doesn't, because they're not going to rework the entire mechanics of how the game functions. This is Bethesda, who should have a reputation for being incredibly lazy. Another upside to being so late with getting this review out is observing the lasting impact of this game, which seems to be little to nothing. Between mid-September all the way to December, the Steam ratings fucking plummeted. And aside from the most die-hard of Bethesda fans, I don't see many people talking much about this game anymore. Many YouTube videos talking positively about this game are floundering, with the most successful videos being ones that mock and deride the game for being the piece of garbage that it is. The biggest cultural impact that this game seems to have had was in Az's rant, which he was right by the way. Since its release, it's been interesting to track player numbers and how Baldur's Gate 3 consistently has several times the number of players Starfield did, despite being released a month before Starfield. It's very convenient that a real RPG released so close to Starfield to serve as a pretty good comparison at the difference actual effort makes, as opposed to pumping out lazy slop. 
This isn't just a matter of Bethesda getting diminishing returns on their style of games, but the fact that their games are still getting more and more simplified with each iteration. There's more and more generic procedural slop. Additionally, I'm seeing general sentiment towards Bethesda sliding further and further towards people disliking and mocking how simplistic their games are. This is a good thing. Same with the phrase Todd Slop coming into use in reference towards these games, and it feels like more and more people are waking up to the fact that Skyrim and Fallout 4, Bethesda's two previous big games, aren't as good as people once thought they were. This isn't an issue of old games aging poorly, either. There were games long before Skyrim and Fallout 4 that had far more depth. What we're seeing here is entropy. The continual gradual decline in standards has resulted in the long-term decline in quality of Bethesda's games, and we've reached a point where it's becoming more and more noticeable to people, and it's becoming unsustainable. Yes, they're backed by Microsoft now, but even then, these diminishing returns will start hurting them. The only reason Starfield's overall score on Steam is still as high as it is, is because it was massively and positively review-bombed on day one of release, when most people wouldn't have had the time to explore the game with any depth. The most important part is it seems like people are starting to realize how garbage modern Bethesda's games are, and this is a good thing, because it will hopefully lead to Bethesda eventually realizing what they're doing wrong and course-correct. Hopefully. Alright, that was quite the preamble. Let's get into this. The first thing I want to talk about is Bethesda's claim that this game is the culmination of 25 years worth of work, because that looks really bad when you deliver a game of this quality, with so much nothing to its main story. I'm not sure I've ever played a game this boring and mediocre, and I had to force myself to complete it for the sake of this review. I say this without a hint of hyperbole, but a vast majority of the main story are fetch quests upon fetch quests, with little more to it than that. There is so little substance to this main story, that there's really only four segments of it that I actually need to talk about in the spoiler section, with an additional bit that very slightly augments the fetch quests. Otherwise, about half of the main story is being directed to artifact parts or in random caves, and taking them with little more to it than that. Sometimes an enemy base will be on top of them, but otherwise it's the same. It is insane that about half of this game's main story content are empty, radiant fetch quests. There are a few times where the game tries to add extra stuff to these quests, but mostly comes across as padding rather than any kind of well-thought-out scenario or encounter. In fact, most of this game comes across as padding. The first time they try to do something extra is chasing down a dude who got his hands on an artifact piece. He patrols the soul system and has gone missing, so you have to track him down by finding evidence, which is presented in a way I found extremely unengaging. You get info from a guy running a bar on Mars, who sends you to the only patrol point he knows from the dude you're looking for. There's snake cult members near a satellite that has info on where he went from there, leading you to a space station near Earth, which is just a dungeon full of enemies. There you find a notepad that has information on where he went next, and that's where you find him. You then find a ship that's been taken over by space pirates, and you have to damage it until you can board it. Once on board, you kill a few generic enemies, talk to him, and he gives you the artifact piece. My main problem with this, aside from combat, space combat, and world building, is the fact it feels like there's little to no substance to any of this. You're getting information to get information to get information to talk to a guy. Rather than being any kind of intelligent investigation, it's essentially you leapfrogging from map marker to map marker, with each part feeling like a speed bump to the rest of the mission. Persuade this guy, sneak up on the satellite to get the information, do a dungeon full of enemies, fight this ship. I feel like I get more out of this sequence of events in even Fallout 4, but here it's pretty much as shallow as can be. You could skip all the dialogue and complete the quest with ease, without having listened to anything the game has to say, and in fact, you'd probably be better off for it. The next time the game does something like this is in Aquila, where the game gives you Sam Ko as your companion. Your goal is to go to the local bank to get an old map his ancestor made when he first settled here. Unfortunately, there's been a robbery in this bank, and the robbers are holding people hostage inside. I failed the persuasion check here, so I went in and killed them. Luckily, they didn't hurt the hostages at all, 
and they all just returned to work as though they weren't hostages just 30 seconds ago. You check the vault to find the maps are gone. We then go talk to Sam's father and they don't like each other. Now it appears as though you can steal the maps from him, but I succeeded on the persuasion check here and was just given them. It's here I'm going to ask the first of my big questions with this main story. But why the hell is there only one copy of this map? They act like it's some sacred family heirloom that they're entitled to as the family legacy. But it's just a map of the local area. Shouldn't there be a bunch of these for sale for travelers and locals? Anyways, we needed this map because Sam's ancestor found a place where nothing would grow and no animals would go near. Sam suspects that this is where the artifact piece is, so off we go! It's a dungeon of generic baddies. You take the artifact, confront the leader of the baddies, and that's all, folks. Oh yeah, you never have to deal with Sam's father again in the main story. It's also worth mentioning that this location is a stone's throw from the city. Later on, we get one in Neon to buy an artifact that was stolen from some big CEO. Naturally, he wants it back. During the deal, the game goes out of its way to give you the option of attacking him or grabbing the artifact and running. Walter will even tell you through dialogue before the meeting that this is possible. It is not. The game will stop you from doing so if you try. Why even give the option if the game is going to stop you? This comes across as though it was designed to be infuriating. This brings me to one of the most annoying parts of the game outside of the spoiler section. After you buy the artifact piece, your ship is impounded and you have to talk to the CEO guy. Alright, that makes sense, we've got some kind of bargain to make. I'm afraid Mr. Slayton is a very busy man. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. Oh, I think we can make an exception in your case. Mr. Slayton will see you. Just use the elevator. Wait. This clearly is an executive. He's on to us. Walter. Uh, taking what's mine, then. Breaking into my office. A bold move, but one easily countered. Oh, we're trapped. Yeah, this shit is obnoxious as fuck. Why even give me the option to persuade if you're just going to make me do all this crap anyways? First time I saw this was on my friend Setch's stream, but I made sure to do the same persuasion check to set up a meeting to talk to him, and I still get accused of trying to sneak into his office, which I clearly wasn't trying to do. Then I have to do this tedious stealth section, then a combat section just to confront this guy. Oh, and it doesn't matter if you kill him or make a deal with him, and making a deal costs you nothing, it's just an automatic win button. At least, nothing happens in the main story. Walter, who is with you for this, will confront you about whether killing someone was wrong, but motherfucker, he had his men try to kill us. I think what it comes down to is that they coded this super slick stealth segment, and they wanted to make sure you didn't miss it, so they forced you through this super lame and tedious stealth section, rather than respecting your choice. Why even give the option of setting up a meeting if it does nothing? Now these segments might seem pretty big, and honestly, they do draw the playtime out, but it honestly feels like that's what they were designed around, and keep in mind, there's shit I'm cutting out too, like doing a background check on the cellar in Neon. These segments feel like padding, and that doesn't change, especially in the penultimate mission that I'll discuss in the spoiler section, because it's the one quest in the main story where they at least try to do something interesting. But despite their size, the impact seems rather small. I don't count these sections as spoilers because they reveal nothing of the main story, which brings me to the biggest pre-spoiler issue with this main story, and that's the fact that there's no narrative hook here, and I don't know why I'm doing any of this shit. Most stories in both games and movies have some kind of narrative hook that... Well, hooks you in. Gives you a reason for continuing with the story. Assassins attacked my sons, and I am next. I can go no further. You alone must stand against the Prince of Destruction and his mortal servants. He must not have the Amulet of Kings. Take the Amulet. Give it to Joffrey. He alone knows where to find my last son. Find him and close shut the jaws of oblivion. Attention. 
You have suffered minor head trauma. This is considered an optimal outcome. This PDA has now rebooted in emergency mode with one directive to keep you alive on an alien world. Please refer to the data bank for detailed survival advice. Good luck. The Aurora suffered orbital pile failure. Cause unknown. Zero human life signs detected. We carry Mind Flayer parasites. Unless we escape, unless we are cleansed, our bodies and minds will be tainted and twisted. Within days, we will be Gaith. Mind Flayers. After five years on the East Coast, it was time to go home. What's up? Carla Sweet. What's up, Sweet? What you want? This mama. She's dead, bro. Oh, shit. Asshole. Here we go again. This shit's real fucked up. Everything. What you mean? What, apart from your mother being dead? Things are going real bad. Here, here let me show you running, man. Tony's buried over there. Little devil over there. It big devil over there. Man, it's just crazy. Everybody blasts on food first, then ask questions second. So when you leaving, Carl? I ain't sure. Thought I might stay. Things is fucked up. <laughs> the last thing we need is your help. Ah, man, I won't let you down. I swear. The realm of oblivion is invading. We must relight the dragon fires to seal them away. Your ship has been blown out of orbit by an unknown force. The depths of this planet hold your salvation. There's a worm in your head that will kill you and turn you into a monster. CJ is estranged from his family and is trying to reconnect after his mother's death, only to find a deeper conspiracy and leads him on a wild adventure. Each game has a story to tell, regardless of how much that story comes up in the game itself, and it gives you a reason to continue playing, to completing your goals. Demons are invading from hell, you've got diseases killing you, you've got a brain worm that will turn you into a monster, and you ultimately want to free your brother from jail and take down your former friends who betrayed you. Starfield doesn't have any such thing. You start off in a mine, and you collect a fragment of some unknown alien artifact, get a vision, and this somehow changes your destiny, and you're essentially forced to join Constellation, a group interested in finding more of these artifact pieces. After that, your goal is to just collect more, because aren't they neat? I wonder what they do. These artifact pieces are simultaneously hyped up by Constellation to be something special, yet at the same time apparently no one else in the universe cares that alien artifacts exist, proving the existence of non-human intelligent life in space. Nor are they interested in finding out what they do. The people who do have them use them as decorations or collector's items as curiosities, as opposed to the major scientific discoveries they should be. One of the missions I didn't talk about has you persuade or fight some guy who has one in his vault to give it up, and his whole thing is being a collector of stuff. You kill, steal, lie, threaten, and risk your life time after time for these things, all because Constellation thinks they're special. You had a vision, and a good old shrug is your core motivation for this entire main story prior to the big reveal. Not once, even after the big story moments, did I feel like I was ever building to something special, nor did I feel like I was accomplishing anything. I was just doing stuff, because the game wanted me to do stuff. This is the main story, by the way. This is the whole point of the game existing, and most of it amounts to... Yeah, just collect some stuff, I guess. I don't know. Part of the problem is the fact that Constellation and all of its characters seem to exist for no good reason, aside from helping the player. All these characters largely come across as cardboard cutouts with one personality trait, not so different from Bethesda's previous games, where what little personality they have is either carried by the voice actor's skills, or is otherwise what very few traits Bethesda gives them. Rather than feeling like real characters in the world with their own goals, ideas, and ambitions, they serve the role of existing, so this questline can exist, 
so they can point you in a direction to go and come across as an illusion of being a dedicated group when it feels like they don't do anything. If they're not your companion or forced upon you for a quest, they're always just idling in the lodge waiting for you to do all the hard work. Now I am about to move into spoiler territory for the main story, but there is one thing I have to mention. If you're intent on playing this game, including the main story, then do the main story first. Don't waste your time on building settlements or getting money or getting a bunch of ships or anything. You lose all items, all companion relationships, all money, all ships, and so forth upon entering New Game Plus mode. So for any completionists out there who ensure they get as much as they can out of the game before doing the main story, or for anyone who simply plays casually and does a bit of this and a bit of that while doing the main story, you will lose everything except your skills. Now for the actual spoiler section. Again, skip to this timecode on screen to avoid spoilers. Otherwise, let's get to this shit. Upon leaving Neon, you're confronted by a Starborn, a seemingly alien race that does not want you to have the artifact pieces. I don't fully know what your options are here. There's the implication you can run away, but my friend Such tried during his playthrough and was told he can't fast travel during combat, even though warping of an area should totally work given the setting. Both of us decided to fight and beat the Starborn. You return to the Lodge with this information, and this raises another issue. The acting in this game is complete ass. Here these people are, discovering and encountering things that should change their perspective of the universe, and they're treated as little more than interesting curiosities, even when these things are what the entire group exists for. They analyze the Starborn ship, and one character speculates that it's aliens, one character thinks they're angels, and another just thinks it's a human ship, just highly advanced. This is also the slight augment I mentioned earlier. All future artifacts collected from a cave or a dungeon will have a Starborn there guarding it. Despite potentially discovering alien life, most characters just kind of treat it as business as usual, as opposed to this being a shocking revelation that should be news for all of mankind. Oh yeah, through all of this, you start getting missions to go to alien temples at random. You only really need to do the first one, the rest are optional. That said, these temples, in my experience, don't seem to have anyone that notices or cares about them. Again, ancient alien temples, you'd think this would set the scientific community on fire, but no. Somehow, no one has ever discovered these temples before, and if they have, no one cares. Keep in mind, too, that they register as disturbances on scans. That's how you find them, and nearly every planet you visit seems to have signs of human life on it in some form or another. Remember that the discovery of any artificial construct that predates mankind's exploration into space, or discovery of these planets, are signs of intelligent life existing, even if it's something simple like a spear, or a stone temple, or a cave painting. These places should be hotbeds of scientific discovery and research, but they're not. These temples essentially boil down to dragon shout word walls, but far more obnoxious. See, at least in Skyrim, you just had to walk up to the wall and you'd get the word. Here, a glob of space jizz appears in a random spot in the room, and you have to fly there in zero G to get it. The timer on it seems to be very short, too, and it will disappear and reappear elsewhere if you don't get it in time. This leads into an extremely tedious segment of the game, where you're flying around this room trying to collect the space jizz, until the metal rings in the middle of the room align. Once they do, you fly into them and you get your dragon shout. Back at the lodge, the first time after doing this, you're told to test your power, and similarly to before, everyone acts slightly surprised, despite the discovery of literal magic. A character mentions that your cardiovascular and neurological activity are off the charts. Shouldn't you go visit a hospital or something? What if you're dying? What if you've got space aids? <coughs> you should at least get a checkup, right? Nope, just continue collecting artifact pieces. About halfway through the main story, Vlad needs you and some of the others to go to the space station and repair some stuff, which is a busy do-nothing quest that exists solely to set up some contrived bullshit a little later on. After getting the artifact piece from the Collector, The Hunter arrives, a character that talks like an edgy Sonic OC. 
nothing personnel, kid. They called me the Hunter. And now that I'm here, your pardon glimpsing the unity is over. The Hunter wants your artifact pieces, and for some reason, this necessitates him attacking the Eye, Constellation Space Station where a bunch of its members were just shipped off to. You could choose to run to the Eye to help defend it, or stay in the Lodge and help defend that, since he says he's coming down to the Lodge. I stayed in the Lodge and had an interesting experience as a result, and by interesting I mean contrived and obnoxious. I died a couple times here, which is actually a good thing, as it's a benefit to both this review and my eventual analysis to have done so, as it helped me learn some things. First of all is the contrived way in which this is set up. See, Walter is up on the balcony with a gun, overlooking the main room. This is fine. On my first attempt, he had been taken hostage and I had no idea how it happened. On the second attempt, I saw him randomly run away. And on the third attempt, I saw what you're probably never meant to see. He runs to a spot, for no reason whatsoever, like an actor to a mark on a stage, so he could get grabbed by the hunter. They didn't even bother to come up with a reason for why Walter got captured, he just did. Because reasons. Because he was scripted to run to a specific spot so the story can progress. Remember, 10 out of 10 game, everyone. Look, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that this one thing breaks the game entirely, but it certainly does do damage to it. When engaging with a story, the believability of the world is important, even in fantastical settings with magic. Because how believable we find the world, the events, the stakes, the characters, and the actions they take, oftentimes influences how much we care about a given story. In Lord of the Rings, we understand the threat the One Ring poses. We understand the life Frodo is leaving behind. We understand what the Ring does to people, through its corruptive influence through many examples. We understand the characters and their motivations and goals, and the choices they make, and the result is a world and story that is stronger in terms of writing quality for it. It's a world that is believable given the rules it establishes, despite the fantastical nature, because it's treated and portrayed as a real place with real people with real struggles, as opposed to a stage play where an actor gets a cue to walk into place so the next event can happen. Shit like this takes me right out of a story, because rather than feeling like a real world with real people, it becomes completely artificial. Had I been engaged with this story, this moment might actually have ruined a big part of the game for me, especially since this is the first real big moment of the story, and a character within Constellation is about to die. To make matters worse, the Hunter is invincible until you properly trigger him. On the second time around, knowing where he is in the Lodge, I went the long way around to come up behind him, you know, use some intelligent tactics to get the upper hand on him. Yeah, shooting him from behind without triggering him does nothing, showing just how on rails and scripted this game is. Anyways, I defeat the hunter and we're led on an escape through the New Atlantis Underground to get to the ship to fly to the eye. Take note of the condition New Atlantis is in. Also, this seems set up to be a really tense escape but comes across as awkward when everyone is just kind of jogging through the underground with nothing happening. I guess they didn't expect me to beat the hunter? Anyways, on the space station, you find out someone has died. Now, I'm not exactly clear on how this is balanced, but it seems as though the two characters that like you the most will be at stake here. The one left on the eye, and the one sent with you to the scow, who remains in the lodge if you go and help the eye during the hunter's attack. Either way, one of them dies. 
Upon return to New Atlantis, you find the city has come under heavy attack. How did this happen during my quick run to the eye? And how did the hunter do all this damage alone? Look, ML Pagliarillo is incompetent as a writer. But it seems as though he's actively getting worse. Or maybe Bethesda is just getting more lazy, it's not exactly clear. People are injured. There's a big mess all over the place. A ship has been outright destroyed. There's severe damage to the area. The sky is dark and hazy. All from a guy who didn't even do anything, and is forced to retreat because I kicked his ass in round one, and the city was in perfect condition just a few minutes ago when we left. When engaging with the story, the believability of the world is important, even in fantastical settings with magic, because how believable we find the world, the events, the stakes... Oh, fuck it. One fast travel later and all this is cleaned up, by the way. Next is one of the most long and drawn-out quests in the game, which is saying something considering some of the other sections of the game, including the penultimate quest. See, the Starborn mentioned something about the Unity, and a member of Constellation who is also deeply religious mentions that he's heard that word before, as if it's some new invented word no one has ever heard before, like Schmorgelglump. When in reality, Unity is a normal-ass word. It's the name of a fucking game engine. I can't actually call this game uncreative, for the fact that this quest is the most creative way I've ever seen to make playing a video game for entertainment purposes as tedious as fucking possible. So you talk to the Space Pope and learn of a story shared between different factions, as they each tell different versions of it. So you hear the Space Pope's version, some dude's version, and a snake cultist's version, and you relay the other two versions back to the Space Pope. From this, he extrapolates information to send you off to the next location. The way this is done is really dumb, too. One story mentions second, and the number two a few times, so that's how he determines it's the second planet in a system. Another version of the story has some numbers, which he figures are coordinates, and his own story has a clue to the system the planet is in, and is presented in the dumbest way possible. This feels like he arrived at the solution because he was scripted to, not because he genuinely figured it out for himself. And yes, I realize it's a work of fiction, all story content is scripted. The point I'm making is that it seems absurd that jumping to random guesses as to random numbers being coordinates and parts of a word meaning a solar system would be the actual solution to this mystery, all based on the fact that an alien said the word unity. So we go to the planet where the pilgrim from the three stories lived. Despite being abandoned for what appears to be quite a while, inside looks quite clean and modern, and he's still got fresh food there. You read his journal and get information on where to go next. You see what I mean about this entire game being a set of fetch quests? Get the thing to get the thing to get the thing to get the thing. This sends you off to another planet. Here, you must cross a lake of poison, which naturally affects you through your airtight spacesuit, and you reach an island, where a wild animal will lead you to this... thing. You have to use the control panel to move a light to a specific point on the ground that is told to you. Doing this gives you the next place to go to. I'm not fucking joking, this is something you actually have to do, as part of the main story in this game. You reach the new destination to find the Hunter Starborn ship there. He's meeting with the other Starborn we encountered outside of Neon, the Emissary. Now, if the game didn't have issues already, this is where it starts to completely shit itself. It comes across as though they're trying to do something really lofty here, only for the story to trip down the stairs and break its neck. After some back and forth, the Emissary reveals himself to be the Constellation member that died earlier. Once again, I'm forced to talk about how incompetent ML is as a writer. So this is yet another lame twist, much like the one in Fallout 4. ML seems to think big twists make a story good. He is wrong. A twist is not inherently good. It's only as good as the writing is to support it, and the writing here is dog shit. A twist should make you look back at the rest of the story in retrospect, and see hints and signs of the story building towards the twist. Things should make more sense as a result. The story should be stronger as a result of a good twist. 
This wasn't done for any creative storytelling reasons, it doesn't change anything in retrospect. It's done purely for shock value. And you could tell this was the case through the presentation and set up to everything about this. The emissary's voice and face are obscured, so you can't tell who it is. Then he reveals himself in a way that's clearly meant to be shocking above all else. In fact, you could probably make the argument that it would be incredibly cruel to just suddenly drop this on someone who just saw you die without any warning at all. Further, what makes this even more stupid is in the way the emissary talks before and after the reveal. See, most people have a way of speaking that tends to be pretty distinct. Sure, you might talk in a way similar to someone else, but people don't tend to randomly change the way they talk for the sake of preserving a plot twist. To make this point as clearly as I can, I'm going to use National Treasure Chills as an example. Number 15. Honestly, if I saw that damn thing in my living room, I'd stomp on it until it was a small brown stain. Chills is a YouTuber who makes paranormal list videos of questionable quality. But most importantly of all, he has a very distinct way of speaking. Number 15. Could I get the number 15? No amount of putting filters over his voice will change the inflection he has when speaking. So even with filters on, you'd be able to tell it was him. Now it could potentially be someone who speaks similar to him, or someone doing an imitation, but the point is that Chills himself won't speak completely differently to how he already does for no reason whatsoever. The Emissary talks with a very lofty, almost angelic voice, as if he's some kind of higher being, because the game hasn't determined which character of Constellation it's gonna be yet. Your success is unprecedented. Before you came, we were just discussing how continued use of force against you is unwise. So it can't assign any particular speaking style to the Emissary. But then as soon as the Emissary is revealed, like flipping a goddamn switch, they just talk exactly as they did normally as a member of Constellation. You say that now, but your kind is not ready for the artifacts. The Starborn know what you are, what you are capable of. The Unity. You are on the path to it. It is a place, a gateway. It is where we were reborn. Not a relatively expendable Dusty anymore, are you? Look at where you've ended up. I collected the remaining artifacts, and they opened the way to the center of my universe, and the doorway to an infinite number of others. That is the unity. When I stepped into it, I became a starborn. It's how I've entered other worlds, including yours. This is incredibly contrived and stupid, all for the sake of yet another obnoxious plot twist. Just as a reminder, Fallout 4's story outright breaks in numerous places, all in preservation of the twist. A big example I used in my 14-hour Fallout 4 analysis is the fact that Sean convinces you that he's your son based on the fact that you had no concept of the passage of time while frozen in the vault. But when it comes time for him to justify throwing you out into the wasteland so the entire first half of the game can exist, he says that he was curious to see if you'd still look for him after all this time. In the vault, you had no concept of the passage of time. You were released from your pod and went searching for the sun. You'd lost. Perhaps most curious to me, would you, after all this time, attempt to find me? And now I know the answer. These two things massively contradict each other because they are mutually exclusive beliefs. You cannot believe that someone both had no concept of the passage of time, while also wondering if they'd look for their missing child after a long passage of time. This was done purely for shock value, then covering for why the first half of the main story exists, and it's completely contradictory. This is a similar case where someone is taken away from you, then shoved back in your face purely for shock value and nothing more. This doesn't add to the story, it doesn't make it deeper, it doesn't improve the quality of the writing. There's no value to it. The only possible argument in defense of this is that the Emissary is introduced prior to the Constellation member dying, so the game doesn't know which voice to attribute to the Emissary yet, but that's still an issue of the writing, as writers decided to construct the story in this way so as to have this dumb twist. 
Remember that writers are akin to gods with full control of everyone's fate in a story. Every word a character speaks, every action a character takes, every event that occurs within a story is under complete control of the writer. So any fault or issue of that story is, by extension, the fault of the writer. Because stories don't construct themselves, a writer comes up with ideas and puts them together, and how coherent the final product ends up being is dictated by the writer's competence in stringing together events and ideas and making them work within the framework of the universe we're presented with. Ned Stark doesn't randomly have his head cut off. There's a series of events and decisions by multiple characters that lead to this outcome, and based on everything we're shown of Westeros and the characters within it, this is the most logical outcome for this situation. Joffrey is portrayed as a cruel and sadistic little bastard for his entire time on the show. It makes sense that he would take Ned's head. It wouldn't make sense for Joffrey to spare him outright, or even make him take the black. This twist is terrible, because it arbitrarily obscures information and details that should have been available and completely changes the character to allow this twist to exist. This is also where we get the big reveal. There's a multiverse. I'm already sick to death of multiverse slop, but this is possibly the worst execution I've seen of it. So the whole idea behind the multiverse, from what I understand, is that there's an infinite number of alternate universes for every possible outcome to every possible situation, and this would naturally be true for every alternate universe as well. Essentially, countless trillions of alternate universes are splitting off of each other at an exponential rate every second, and that's a lowball. Given a simple yes or no choice alone spawns an infinite number of alternate universes, because even with a yes or no choice, the multitude of possible outcomes are vast and infinite. Variations depending on how long you take to answer. Variations depending on things you can't possibly account for, or assume. What if you decide to not answer? What if you decide to punch the guy in the face who asks you this question? What if a satellite fell out of orbit and landed on you, killing you? What if you spontaneously combust? What if the guy who asks you the question punches you? What if the intrusive thoughts win? Point is, there's so many possible outcomes to the multiverse that given enough distance from your own universe, the changes would become immense. What we get instead is alternate Barrett talking to me as if he's the same Barrett I knew and being told that I'm so pathetic that I die in every other version of the universe that these two chuckle fucks have been to and they've been to thousands. In fact, that's why Edgy the Hedgy over here is playing nice for now. He wants to see what will happen because my character almost never survives in the other universes and that's a big change for him. By the way, he reveals himself too. You didn't survive because of righteousness. You won because of persistence, luck, and skill. As I have done countless times. I was also human once. But what does it matter who or what I was when eternity is within your grasp? Who? Oh. Yeah, the guy we met in the last quest, he's the big bad villain of this game. Kinda. Well, a multiverse version of him. Also, he's not actually antagonistic towards you for the rest of the game, unless you side against him at the very end. So I'm not even sure it's accurate to call him the main antagonist, when he's not actively working against you for most of the game. Meaning, this game has no main antagonist. See, collecting all the artifact pieces builds the armillary, which is the thing that allows you to ascend to become a Starborn. You apparently gain some power or some such from this, even though the Hunter still goes down like a bitch. If he gains power from each time he does this, and he's done it hundreds or even thousands of times, shouldn't he be an unstoppable demigod? I guess not. The various Starborn, including the Emissary and the Hunter, are after the artifact pieces from this universe, so they can do this all over again in the next universe ad infinitum. Much like the main story, it seems as though the whole goal is to do this for the sake of doing it. There's vague mentions of obtaining power, but it's not clear what this power even is, which is kind of important when you consider that you're doing a lot of work and killing a lot of people 
for these artifact pieces, especially if you're the hunter who can still get fucking murked by a rando. This is where the game sets up a choice you're gonna make relatively soon. Conveniently color-coded, too. White for the obvious good guy, and black for the obvious bad guy. You don't make the choice quite yet, though. You're sent to the moon to do a fetch quest in an old base, then you're sent to Earth to do a fetch quest in an old space base. It's a big long section in which you delve into this ancient base and slowly learn information about why the Earth is dead. Oh yeah, I didn't mention that part yet, did I? Yeah, Earth is gonzo. It's a wasteland with no life on it whatsoever anymore. This was almost certainly done so as to not have to model an entire planet, and you can't really get away with the entire Earth being proc gen sludge. Anyways, you learn through these station logs that the man who invented the grav drive, the means of ships traveling from system to system, learned this information from an alternate version of himself, supposedly from the future. In other words, his alternate self appears to be a starborn. We also find out the grav drives are what killed Earth. All the jumps from the moon had an impact on Earth's atmosphere and caused it to leak away. Now why isn't this a problem happening to every other planet in the game? Well, they fixed it, of course, but too late to save Earth. Even though Victor's alternate self warned him about this and just apparently didn't do anything about it. By the way, the fix was a software patch, so it wasn't even an issue with the physical hardware itself. A coding error in grav drives is what destroyed Earth. It was so easily fixed that it was hidden in a software update, and the death of Earth was totally preventable, and they just didn't do it until it was too late. I'm not sure you could have come up with a more boring or awful answer if you tried. After you get the artifact piece from this place, Starborn starts showing up and you have to fight them to the exit. Outside you have another encounter with the Emissary and the Hunter, and this is where you get to choose sides. The Hunter believes anyone should be able to go through the Unity, as long as they can get the artifacts and get there. The Emissary believes that only select people should go through. They both want to see you succeed now, and are willing to help you in this, but if you decide to go it alone, they decide they must stop you and will work together to do so. Your options are side with the good guy, side with the bad guy, or go it alone for an obvious good, evil, and true ending selection. If you choose to go it alone, the Hunter will immediately say that the Emissary is his new best friend, making this whole choice even more stupid. Why are these two now suddenly willing to work together when they have totally opposing beliefs? This is contrived as all hell to ensure there's some kind of final conflict with at least one of these two or both of them for the finale of the game, which we're rapidly approaching. It was likely done this way because the game never established a proper overarching antagonist to be working against your goals, so instead we get these two lame shallow chuckle fucks. After that, we finally reach the penultimate quest, and arguably the only interesting quest until they ruin it in multiple ways. Upon reaching the planet, you hear a distress signal, and it sounds bad. But upon reaching the lab, you find people who are on edge, but otherwise seem alright. As you're escorted to go meet the director, you're transported a few times into an alternate version of the lab that has been destroyed and taken over by the local wildlife, and you meet the sole survivor. You discover that there is an accident down in the lower levels, where they were doing some experiments on an artifact, and this led to two parallel versions of reality, one where Raphael died to save everyone else, and one where Raphael is the sole survivor. The thing to note right away is that this is somehow completely detached from the whole main story multiple universes thing that's going on with the Starborn. This is its own thing. It's like something out of a Star Trek episode or something. Now, due to locked doors on the clean side due to an emergency lockdown that has to be released in stages, and pathways being blocked due to rubble or bug nests on the burnt side, you have to go through these portals to swap between realities once they figure out a way to attune you to them. First problem is the initial moral choice that's presented that you can choose which version of reality gets to persist, while the other is erased forever. This is a trolley problem, but worse because the game answers it for you. You could save the life of one man, or save the lives of about a dozen people. In the burnt reality, Raphael will literally tell you that he would have preferred to have sacrificed himself in order to save everyone else. You don't even really have to make the choice, the game just answered the question for you. 
Secondly, the game proves that you can bring things from one side to the other, by the very nature that all of your equipment comes with you when you travel over, but that you can bring stuff back, in particular, a vital quest item. Additionally, if you think about it a little more than not at all, you hear Raphael's distress call, but arrive at the clean lab, which implies that your entire ship traveled between versions of reality as well, between orbiting the planet and landing on it, thus proving there's either no size limit on this, or the size limit on traveling between realities is so big that your entire ship comes with you. So immediately, you should be able to save Raphael by just bear-hugging him and using the thing to travel back to the clean side. No, instead there's some big long convoluted way to save everyone, and there's a solution that seems really obvious. Third problem is that this quest just goes on and on and on and on. Largely because of the nature of traveling to two different versions of the dungeon through portals, and it's a fairly long dungeon. What was initially a neat idea wore out its welcome incredibly quickly, and turned the whole process into a massive slog. This also seems to be the one artifact piece that is inconsistent with the rest. The game establishes that the first person to touch an artifact piece experiences this vision. As best as I can tell, this remains consistent until this point. Everyone you mine out of a cave gives a vision, while everyone held by someone else previously doesn't. This one is still embedded in rock, but has clearly been experimented on. Either this is a break in consistency, as I don't know how you build an entire facility around this thing and experiment on it without ever touching it, or... Well, yeah, somehow no one ever touched this thing, which I'm just not buying. Now we finally move on to the finale of the game. Just to recap quickly, most of the main story is nothing but fetch quests, which seems like they're only there to pad out the game. The first time we get any significant story section is meeting with the Emissary and the Hunter. Then they send us to Earth, and now we get the finale. Keep in mind too, a bunch of these fetch quests are Radiant quests because fucking of course they are. We're now off to the final artifact piece in an overly long dungeon in a series of obnoxious boss fights. First of all, this is already a massive facility that seems to have been active prior to the gang squatting here being wiped out by the Starborn. It once again raises the issue of artifacts existing in places where people are actively living, and no one seems to give a shit. Yes, this is explained as the Starborn getting them to do this, to build this facility here, but that doesn't excuse these people not interacting with the magic temple in their basement. Anyways, we then fight Guardian Musa. Who? You know, Guardian Musa. That character that, uh... Well, he, um... Hmm. If we're gonna have this big boss rush with Starborn characters, why are they just a bunch of randos instead of people we might know? Like, yeah, it would be ham-fisted and dumb if every single one of these guys were Constellation members, but they could be other people kind of like how the Hunter is the Space Pope. My issue with the Hunter being the Space Pope, aside from the fact that he's an edgy-as-fuck cartoon character, is the fact that it's presented as a really big reveal. Your character almost seems betrayed by the fact it's him, and it's some dude we met and talked to for like two minutes one entire quest ago. He should have either been a complete unknown, an original character not related to anyone we know, and not have some big twist reveal of who he is, or he should be someone more important to the player somehow. Honestly, the best I've got is another Constellation member, because they're the only characters of any importance you deal with repeatedly in the main story, and even then they come across as a little more than cheerleaders than anyone actually important. Anyways, his special power is to make copies of himself. Next Starborn is a literal magic necromancer, as he brings back the dead to fight for him. Next Starborn... I'm not even sure he has any powers? He might have just activated the security robots and turrets. Final Starborn makes copies of you and your companion. Essentially, it's just more of this game's unimpressive combat as speed bumps to your goal. This is also where the game starts getting super pretentious with its story. You start seeing visions of areas you've been to, such as the mind from the start of the game, and characters will talk to you, questioning how worthy you are to become Starborn. You also see a vision of a version of you that died in another universe. You reach the destroyed temple and have a final confrontation with the Hunter and the Emissary. 
Now I'm going to take a detour here to talk about a big issue. At the end of Fallout 1, you face off against the Master, the highly intelligent leader of the Super Mutant Army. In this game, you have the ability to talk him down to make him stop his plans and give up. Now this makes sense in the context of the world and character we're dealing with. While he is absolutely erratical in terms of his goals and ideals, he's still largely a rational human underneath. He's logical and is able to change his mind, given the right information. The only way you can talk him down is to provide evidence to him that his super mutants are sterile, they cannot breed, and would die out regardless of what he did. Realizing his master race cannot survive also makes him realize that the death and destruction, the pain and suffering he's caused, has all been for nothing. He realizes his plan is an evolutionary dead end, and he cannot continue with it, and most importantly of all, he's weighed down by the guilt of what he's done. In this ending, his final act is to destroy himself in the facility he's in, which houses many of his top men who are cult-like in their adherence to the Master's plan. At the end of Fallout 2, you face off against Frank Horrigan, a member of the Enclave exposed to FEV and was experimented on extensively. He kills without remorse in the name of the Enclave's goals, and he was conditioned to be a diehard Enclave loyalist to the very end. This is not a man you can reason with. No argument or evidence will convince him or change his mind. You cannot talk him down under any circumstances, and this makes complete sense given the nature of the character. One of the big, very frequently cited criticisms against Fallout New Vegas is the fact that it makes no sense to talk Lanius into retreating, given the fact that he's a brutal, unrelenting killing machine obsessed with victory. But most people who make this criticism never take the time to actually listen to Lanius himself, what people say about him, and they don't take the time to understand his purpose within the world. In short, they take a surface level view of him. They fall for the propaganda the game builds up about him, while never learning about the actual man himself. In terms of final confrontations, many people seem to think he's a Frank Horrigan, when he's more so a master. That is to say, given the right arguments, presented in the right way, you can convince Lanius that the Mojave isn't worth taking right now, that the Legion needs to prepare more to take and hold it. Among the arguments you present to Lanius is the fact that the NCR can barely hold the Mojave as it is. It's utter chaos. The supply lines are a problem for the NCR too, an issue Lanius himself says he faced in the past and he understands the struggles of limited supply lines. You essentially argue the fact that it would heavily damage or even outright kill the Legion to take the Mojave because they're simply unprepared to hold land that, for the most part, isn't worth a whole lot, and especially not the manpower needed to take and control this land to the Legion's standards. Ultimately, you're not even talking him into retreat or abandoning the campaign, but waiting longer to be properly prepared. Would Caesar be mad about this? Yeah, maybe. But he's also the kind of man to listen to the words of someone like Lanius, especially if he can be convinced that the possibility of loss would lead to another embarrassment like the first time they lost the Battle of Hoover Dam. Remember, too, that the Legion's image is one of their biggest strengths, and another loss here would damage that image severely. As to Lanius' character, He's largely built out to be a living piece of propaganda, to instill fear in both his enemies and his own men. You do not want to fail a man like Lanius, because the consequences will be severe. Among the myths built up about Lanius is the fact that he never lost a battle, he's obsessive when it comes to fighting and killing, and he's fiercely loyal to Caesar. The reputation of Lanius is the single most important thing to him. A loss would be an embarrassment, and would destroy his intimidation factor, and would destroy him as a piece of living propaganda for the Legion and against its enemies. So it makes sense, both for Lanius as a character, and through the arguments you present, that he'd back down. He would gather more strength to come back to the Mojave and take it with force. Oh, and the best part? The part that pretty much everyone who makes this criticism misses? If you so much as imply that it's a retreat, even after passing the final skill check, 
He'll abandon that idea entirely and fight you. The East was a hard-fought campaign. Even now, Kaisar drew too much of the Legion's blood needed there for this. Hoover Dam is but a place. I will not have it be the gravestone of the Legion, whether quickly or as you describe slowly by attrition. Retreat? Retreat. I was a fool to listen to you. You know nothing of who I am. Your words have done nothing but delay the inevitable. Now, see what my hounds and my blade will bring to you. Upon hearing the word retreat, he focuses on it and chews on it a bit, coming to the realization that everything you said was a ploy to trick him, and everything you said to convince him to go away is thrown out the window. He is going to fight you, and nothing can make him back down now. So remember how the hunter said he's done this thousands of times and kills anyone who gets in his way? I attacked your lodge because I wanted the artifact, and you held me off. You got away. It means I've seen thousands of universes, collected their artifacts, been to their temples. You have a small taste of their power, but it keeps going. I've simply found that it's the quickest way. Talking, forming alliances, waiting for the right moment to commit theft. It's all so tiresome. There are no rules. Whoever gets all the pieces wins. And I've won. Over and over. I don't kill for the unity. I find the easiest pathway to it. And remember he wants to stop you now? Despite his only goal being gaining more and more power through becoming Starborn countless times over, and he intended to do the same here, he's just perfectly fine with giving up and walking away to what is essentially the equivalent of, maybe don't though. Same goes for the Emissary, who is also willing to fight for the artifacts. There's no solid logical argument that you can make to them that would convince them to stop. And there's no reason for these two to actually not complete their goal of... I'm not even sure how to word this, because they're not becoming Starborn as they already are Starborn. Either way, there's no good reason for them to just give up here and now and walk away, especially since these two are going to team up with you to do this anyways. This is their only purpose, and they just leave because you told them to. It is utter garbage writing. What we get here is what people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about accuse the Lanius encounter of being. It makes no sense at all, based on information given, especially based on what your character says, for these two to just give up and walk away, all at the last minute, because you asked them to. Now that you have the final artifact piece, you can complete the main story. Just shove it into the armillary and do a grav jump. Now this is the part where the main story, which for what little we've gotten so far was bad, gets so much worse. You enter this area, which some may mistake for a cutscene, and walk up to... well, yourself. Waited through that entire movie to see the alien and it was her goddamn father. It comes across as pretentious nonsense that whatever this creature is supposed to be just assumes your appearance and name, all just to waffle on at you about vagaries and empty claptrap about what you've done and what ascending means. Seriously, get a load of this crap. Unknowingly, you just answered your own questions. For who creates things but creators? That is what they have been named throughout the endless circle of time. This is one last fuck you from the game. They raise all these questions about what any of this shit even is, and when you ask who made this and why, the game just vomits out quite possibly one of the most insulting things they could have. Who created this? Well, you answered the question. It was the creators. 
It's just such a stupid, empty, bullshit answer. You know the writers didn't actually come up with anything to answer this question. The artifacts exist because their shitty multiverse story required them for some reason. It begs the question of why you'd even let the player ask this question, if all you're going to get in response is the verbal equivalent of the writers dragging their balls across your face. 25 years in the making, by the way. Todd's dream game, by the way. Bethesda's magnum opus, by the way. This whole encounter amounts to Babby's first philosophy lesson, in which we talk about being happy with who you are and what you've done, or having regrets but moving on, or even not caring that you're a piece of shit, but at an exceptionally low tier. Literally stuff you'll learn as a child. Oh, and that the universe is big and stuff. This is where we get a whole clusterfuck bomb of questions that the game doesn't seem to have an answer for. What does it really mean to become Starborn? What kind of power do you receive? How can the Hunter have done this hundreds, or even thousands of times, to keep gaining power, only to be taken out with a shotgun? If the armillary is needed to travel to the next universe, then how do all the other Starborn get into the next universe? Or do they get trapped in this one? Well, they can't because the Hunter and Emissary have met every time in each universe, and they make it clear that they do not work together. Meaning, either one of them got all the artifact parts, or a different person has at some point in the thousands of universes they've been to, and they still manage to travel to the next universe, as evidenced by the fact you further meet the Hunter again in New Game Plus. Which means the Starborn somehow have the ability to travel to the next universe without the armillary. But as far as I could tell, you never get this ability. If the Starborn have the ability to go from universe to universe, then why can't you return to your home universe? This pretentious piece of shit tells you that by ascending, your universe will be forever changed. What does that mean? How will it be changed? Knowing what happens to your universe is pretty important. We get two little bits of information. The constellation continues and somehow inspires people to start exploring again, which again raises the question of why did they stop in the first place? And if you go it alone, we're told that other people can search for the artifacts without interference of the Starborn, because you stop the Hunter and the Emissary, which has some implications and problems. By default, that means that once someone ascends, all the artifacts reset somehow? How does that work? Why does stopping the Hunter and the Emissary stop all the Starborn? You also don't really stop the Hunter and the Emissary if you talk them down. You just got them to maybe not do it this one time. Further, we find out from the endings that going through the Unity causes actual and permanent mind-altering effects upon everyone in the universe, such as making them more power-hungry if you side with the Hunter, or making marriages prosper if you married a companion, which, due to this mind-altering effect, makes going through the Unity inherently immoral, no matter what changes are made to people, because it's done without their consent or knowledge. Why does Ascending to Starborn conveniently put you right back at the start of this game's sad excuse for a story? We know Starborn have appeared in the universe as far back as before the grav drives were made, which is implied to be a very long time ago, over a hundred years at least. So why does he get sent all the way back to then, and we get sent back to the perfect place in time to do this on infinite loop with extreme ease, as compared to the guy who had to wait over a hundred years, assuming he's even still alive? to find and collect the artifact pieces. If there are numerous Starborn here already, why do they only show up after the Emissary confronts you at Neon? If there are numerous Starborn here, why haven't they started big operations to find these artifact pieces? Why haven't they found them in these caves where they're just sitting there waiting to be taken? Why aren't they in major positions of power and leveraging that to find the artifacts? Surely if you've done this dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of times, You'd have figured out the best way to find these things, right? Like, you get to keep your skills, so if you learn to create a device that can detect them, you can just recreate it in the next universe. The Hunter's answer is to take the easiest path. Essentially wait for everyone else to find the artifacts, then take them by force. He even explains in one of the New Game Plus gimmick encounters, where he's wiped out Constellation, that they're always a good place to stop off on the trip for finding the artifacts meaning he's killed or attacked them in pretty much every version of reality. Further, are there multiple versions of Starborn characters? Can we meet different versions of the Hunter? Technically, yes, and it's a convenient excuse as to why his knowledge will be inconsistent with previous versions of him you've met. 
The same person from multiple universes can become starborn, as we've got two examples of this. In one of the New Game Plus gimmick encounters, you meet an evil starborn version of yourself. In another one, you meet a starborn version of Korra, who wants revenge on another starborn version of yourself, which is proof that there can be multiple versions of everyone as starborn running around any given universe, meaning this shitty rat race is running concurrently in every version of reality with potentially multiple versions of each person from different universes, which means there are also multiple versions of the hunter. Has he ever had to fight a different starborn version of himself? We know it's possible for Starborn to meet other Starborn versions of himself, as this literally happens to you. All of this also raises the question of how the timeline even works with all of the shit. When you ascend, you're sent back to pretty much the start of the game. After the mine, but before the lodge. This implies that ascending to Starborn sets you back in time as well, to a seemingly arbitrary point. Some Starborn are sent back over a hundred years, you're sent back a few days, and there seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. It doesn't send you back to when you first touched the artifact, because we're well past that. It doesn't send you back to when the first artifact was touched, because that was pretty much ancient history at this point. Like most of the questions this game raises, they're seemingly never answered. One of the excuses used by Bethesda is that things are left unanswered, so you can decide for yourself which is nothing less than a complete cop-out from having to answer all the difficult questions that this game raises. This isn't like Shutter Island or Inception, which tells stories that end in a way as to let the audience decide, or to leave things intentionally vague, because the question itself is interesting. This is an example of shit writing causing problem after problem after problem, where they don't have any answers for anything this game sets up or implies, and the best they've got is to hand wave it away and hope people stop asking questions. When you reach Constellation again, they say you just vanished and they're dismissive of you, as if they don't want or need you to be a part of this at all, when they were super insistent that you join them in your own timeline, to the point they literally force you to leave your job to go deliver this artifact piece for them. I guess this can be excused as it being a multiverse and this version of them just don't give a shit. At the start of the video, I mentioned the cope argument that the game improves after being the main story. Apparently there are changes to certain faction questlines I've seen people mention as a defense for the game, but through research online, I haven't actually found any evidence of this yet. I am aware that there are 10 gimmick versions of Constellation you can meet, aside from the default version. I don't remember them all, but to summarize some of them, there's one where there's various versions of you, there's one where there's children role-playing as Constellation for some reason. There's the one I mentioned where Korra wants to kill you because a different version of you killed Sam, and she's upset that you're not the one she's looking for. There's one where Snake Lady is still in the cult and wiped out Constellation. There's one where Sarah Morgan is a plant. There's one where a Starborn version of yourself has attacked Constellation. There's one where Walter sells you the artifact pieces. There's one where the hunter has already wiped out Constellation and gives you their artifact pieces. You get the point. It seems like these were done either to be wacky and weird or to be shocking, but with little more depth to them than that. This is something I'll have to look into with far more depth for the full analysis to see just how much changes. But based on what I've seen from other people's videos, you just get a bunch of artifacts dumped into your inventory and sometimes a fight on your hands. There's so much nothing to the main story, and it's so bad, I don't see how they can make alternate versions that are any good. Especially since many of the big issues are things that are universal. Things that will be the same in every universe, particularly how the Starborn work. As for the side factions, I have no idea what changes there could possibly be to them, but if there are any, I expect them to be small and shallow, just like with Constellation. Remember, this is a game in which a vast majority of its main quest line is fetch quests and radiant quests. They couldn't even be bothered to do a fully fleshed out main story, so I expect the changes to the side factions to be just as gimmicky as the ones to Constellation. If I'm wrong about this, I'll acknowledge such in the eventual analysis of this game. It is worth mentioning that it almost feels as though this game was made to be criticism proof in terms of its story and side factions too because playing every single faction 10 plus times, because whichever version of the universe you get is completely random, is going to take far more time than most people are willing to put into it. 
For my 14 hour long Fallout 4 analysis, I didn't even have to play each of the main factions 10 plus times each. This would mean completing the 20 plus hour long story potentially dozens upon dozens of times to get each possible alternate reality made for each faction, where some things are changed around. Again, if there are changes to the side factions, which I have no evidence of right now. It's essentially a built-in defense now, that completing the main story in each main faction and getting all the information possible will take an exceedingly long time. I'm going to say right now, that even I don't have the patience for that, and I'll likely only talk about what few I find, if any. The saving grace is that if one of these alternate versions turns out to be decent or good, it will likely be the exception, not the rule. Because even then, I'm not expecting any of the changes to be significant, and it will likely be gimmicky crap like with Constellation. But worse than anything else, is that completing the main story seems completely at odds with the rest of the choices the game developers made with this game. One of the big selling points was settlement building again. One of the sad excuses for traits gives you a house to decorate. Shipbuilding and acquiring multiple ships is another big selling point. But you lose all of that because you travel to a different version of the universe. What we're left with is a game where a majority of the content is built around a typical gameplay loop for a Bethesda game, in which you're given a big sandbox to romp around in endlessly, only to wind up with a choice of losing everything you've done or not completing the main story. Because of this, it feels less like you're visiting an alternate reality, and more like you're just hitting a big ol' reset button to lose everything you had, except your skills. What you get on the other side is a starborn spacesuit with random effects and a starborn ship, which in my experience isn't even that good, can't be modified, and is an empty pod without even a bed to sleep in. As far as I could tell, you can't build in the ship or decorate it in any way either. Ultimately, this game left me feeling empty. Every minute played felt like a waste, and it was mostly a series of boring fetch quests with no depth to them, and unengaging combat, and when the story finally started to happen, it was terrible. When it wasn't busy destroying its own world and characters, it was huffing its own farts on base-level philosophical ideas that most people learn by the age of six. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, ML cannot write for shit. This man should not be the lead writer of a fucking episode of Blue's Clues, let alone a big game like this, dealing with themes and concepts far beyond his ability. If this main story is indicative of the rest of the content this game has to offer, then it is not worth it in the slightest. Now there's a bunch of other things to talk about, and admittedly, there's a lot of negativity here too. Starting off with something small, this is what local maps in Starfield look like. Whoa! This is worthless. There are no proper maps for the local area you're in. Local maps in Bethesda games have never been particularly good, especially in Fallout 3, but here it's absolutely dire. You get a render of the area's topography that is entirely blue with some white dots to show height, and that's it. This is completely useless, especially if you happen to be in a city like Aquila. The point of a map is telling you where you are and leading you to places, and this map fails to do this. The best you get is more so where you are in relation to marked locations, and even then, it's not entirely clear which direction you're facing. I had a lot of trouble using this thing to navigate. I have no idea why they thought this was a good idea, but it wasn't. I've heard a rumor that they intend to fix this in a patch, which may or may not be out by the time this review is done, but this isn't the kind of thing that should be a post-launch feature. This should be a basic thing as part of the game from the start. Also, considering how late this review is, it says something that's not already in the game. Moving on to exploration, one of the biggest arguments in defense of Bethesda games is that the exploration is the best part of their games. I've never found this argument persuasive because in my experience, there's very rarely anything truly unique or special to find that would make any location or dungeon particularly memorable, especially in their later games. Fallout 3 is great because of the exploration. You can explore miles of metro tunnels, service tunnels, or samey-looking buildings, and occasionally a vault, I guess. Similarly, same goes for overall dungeon design or any associated lore or story. Sometimes you do have a couple of dungeons or locations that do stand out, 
But they're the exception, not the rule. Most dungeons are just holes in the ground with enemies and loot, which is fine. I just don't think that killing generic nameless enemies to get generic generated loot in random dungeon number 259 is compelling gameplay. I suppose it's fine if you're the kind of person who likes doing dungeons regardless of how shallow and empty they may be, but I don't think it's a strong argument for why any of these games are good. I knew from the start that when Bethesda announced that there would be 1,000 planets to visit and explore, that this would have dire consequences for the world of this game. And to prove my point, I'm actually going to use Minecraft for my example here. Way back when it was announced that they were going to make infinite worlds, or at least worlds that are absurdly huge, I was initially excited. When I got around to playing it for the first time, I quickly realized it was just the same few biomes over and over and over again. To this day, it's the same. If you've seen one mineshaft, you've seen them all. If you've seen one stronghold, you've seen them all. This actually works really well for Minecraft though, as it's also a multiplayer game. When you have a server with dozens or even hundreds of people on it, odds are they aren't going to want to build too closely to someone else, especially if what that other person is building is an eyesore. The extremely vast worlds of Minecraft are useful for having a multiplayer experience in a game all about collecting resources and building things. In fact, some servers even have special resource worlds that are made purely for mining and collecting materials without destroying the regular overworld that most people build in. No such thing is necessary for Starfield as this is a single player game. Most players aren't going to see every planet. Hell, most players probably won't see more than like 30 at most, and many of those will be for quick visits to do a short and simple quest, like running into a cave, collecting an artifact piece, and fucking off to the next planet. And that's not to say that a casual player needs to see every piece of content. The point I'm getting at is that 99.9% .9 of this game is procedurally generated sludge. Most planets, from what I've seen, will have 1-3 to three points of interest already marked for you to check out, and every single other point you can land on the planet will generate a map in total isolation from the rest of the planet. All landing and takeoff animations are canned, which is insane for a game all about space exploration. Each generated space you land in will generate a few points of interest and it takes fucking forever to walk to them and sometimes they'll straight up be nothing special. And your time walking there and back has been wasted. This leads me to two of the really big issues. Not to imply this isn't a massive fucking issue already. First of all, there are no ground vehicles. Having some kind of ground transport would be useful since traveling to locations in these proc gen maps can take quite a bit of time. These were likely excluded because you'd start seeing the seams in the world a lot faster. Secondly, if there are no true full planets, that obviously means you can't fly your ship in atmosphere. This is a point that Bethesda fans were trying to downplay as being important, but I remind you that this is a space exploration game. When you realize that the entire universe is just squares of planet-themed areas to shoot things and loot things in, you come to realize that there's no true space exploration aspect to this game. See, part of the point of having a ship and a whole big universe to explore is in the fact that you can fly around and go do things and things are placed there for you to go find. Finding a unique location in Morrowind was great because it's one of a kind and now that you've discovered it, you know where it is. It exists for a reason. It's part of the world and was designed to be that way. Walking down a road in Morrowind you could see a point of interest that catches your attention or curiosity to go explore. Because you can't fly your ship through space, and because planets don't actually exist, you can't stumble upon something that catches your interest at random. Instead, you select one of the available solar systems, you select a planet, and generic things are generated in a small area. They don't even set these random points of interest to spawn in, in a way that makes sense. I found a POI of a fracking operation. I found beds, cots, food, and no pressurized indoor area for people to live and eat and sleep. Which would have been fine if this wasn't on an empty rock planet with no atmosphere. With Starfield's proc gen sludge, what you get is the same generic buildings copy and pasted infinitely. You could do a dungeon on one planet, go land on another, generate a new square of land, and find the exact same dungeon. To bring this down to the micro level, Imagine a default Unity scene, with a flat plane, and there's a proc gen system for placing a single tree somewhere on this plane. 
and you can roll the dice infinitely on where that tree is going to be. No matter how many times you do it, it's the same tree. No matter where it's placed, it's the same tree. That same concept is what pretty much all of Starfield is, but with more props and things to find than a single tree. Exploration loses its appeal when what you're finding doesn't matter because there's an infinite number of these exact same things you could find on a thousand other planets, or even the same planet. It's the whole idea of the more you have of something, the less it's worth. Ten handcrafted dungeons made to be unique and interesting are better than 10,000 proc gen dungeons that are all samey and boring. Limitations are a good thing. There being an end to the things you can do and find is a good thing. If I wanted to, I could boot up Morrowind or Oblivion or Fallout 3 or Fallout New Vegas knowing that if I decide to explore the entire world to find everything there is to find, I can go do it. I can go do every dungeon in these games, I can do every quest in these games, I can visit every city, town, cabin, ruin, shrine, or whatever else may be out there. You can't ever truly find everything there is to find, or do every quest there is to do, because there is an absurd amount of landmass across 1000 planets, near infinite dungeons and quests, but it's all radiant proc gen sludge, and as shallow as a puddle of dog piss, and completely empty of any meaning or substance. The whole Thousand Planets thing seems like it was a little more than a talking point for marketing to get people interested, but it's a completely arbitrary number. They could have just as easily done 10,000 planets, or a million planets, or 900 septillion planets, because when most of the game is made of shallow proc gen shit, the only real limit is how much of it you'll allow the game to generate. As to the point of lacking substance or meaning, when Saints Row 2022 came out, some people dismissed criticism of the game because who cares about story in a Saints Row game? People like that are telling on themselves and they're too stupid to realize it. They expose how shallow they really are. Because these people see games as nothing more than toys. It's just a thing to do, while missing the fact that many of the most memorable moments of a vast majority of games are the big story moments that are well crafted. Who cares about story in a Saints Row game, except all the people who value the big meaningful story moments such as Carlos dying and play a gang revenge on Mayro, saving Shondi at the end of Saints Row 3, Aisha's funeral, and so forth. Few people remember gunning down generic gang member number 3649, but plenty of people remember the big impactful story moments. The substance is important, and Bethesda made a game with little to no substance, resulting in most of the things you're doing for quests amounting to little more than chores or errands for the sake of something to do, as opposed to having any kind of investment in what's happening. Back to the exploration issue. You never do any true exploring, and you're seemingly never alone. As best as I can tell, every planet has been explored. There's often usually signs that people are either here currently or have been here before. You are never the first person to step onto a planet, and pretty much every planet I land on, including barren rocks with no atmosphere, I had ships landing all around me all the time. You are an explorer, and the only thing you can explore are places that have been found and explored by other people long before you. You should have the freedom to travel the stars, but Starfield only ever gives the illusion of doing this, as pretty much all space travel is done through menus and loading screens. The best you get is a skybox to fly around in, with a PNG of a planet, sometimes some rocks or debris, sometimes a random encounter with a ship that needs help, or a derelict ship, or some spooky space pirates, but this is only ever in orbit of a planet. There is no flying off to the deep recesses of space, because they simply do not exist. There is no exploring unique worlds, because there are none. You cannot fly your ship from planet to planet, because the planets don't actually exist. This game has no concept of what a planet is, as none truly exist. This game has no concept of what space is either. Landing on a planet in a random spot doesn't put you on any kind of celestial body. It generates a chunk of land based on parameters that match the description of a planet, but otherwise exists in total isolation of everything else in the universe. This planet is a desert, so generate a piece of desert. This planet is a forest, so generate a piece of forest. This planet is a barren rock with no atmosphere, 
to generate a barren rock wasteland. In a game like No Man's Sky, the planets exist as real places you can go to, fly your ship across, and land and explore. In Starfield, the planets do not physically exist as a place you can go. Planets as a concept are nothing more than a list of things to modify what the square you land on looks like. Essentially, Starfield took the worst parts of Starbound and No Man's Sky at its worst, and smashed them together to make an even bigger piece of shit. Starbound is a terrible game that actually makes for another good comparison. According to what information I could find, there are at least 12 quadrillion possible planets in Starbound, which seems like a lot at first, until you realize they're just the same few biomes over and over again, with different colored dirt and grass. Otherwise, they're the same. You've seen one desert planet, you've seen them all. You've seen one forest planet, you've seen them all. Rather than exploring billions of different planets, you're exploring the same five with slightly different configurations. I bring this up to prove the point that Proc Gen Slop isn't impressive when you spam it to fill out your world. As much as I hate Fallout 3, 4, and Skyrim, they're still presenting worlds that are largely handcrafted. Even if they failed in other areas, it at least felt like there was a unified area of the world to romp around in that was built for that purpose. With Starfield, what we get are tiny islands of handcrafted content in an overwhelming ocean of unimpressive proc gen shit. Which isn't good in the first place, but this is made exponentially worse when Bethesda's handcrafted content is so shallow and lacking that it's hard to distinguish between what's generated and what's handcrafted. It's like Bethesda has come to the conclusion that procedurally generated content is better simply because there's more of it, quantity over quality. It's the same philosophy that gave us Radiant Quests. Quests that have you doing mindless generic tasks, such as killing a nameless enemy in a random location. They took that concept and applied it to an entire game, with the result being one of the most insanely shallow experiences I've ever seen. Despite having 1,000 planets, with an immense amount of surface space combined, this game ironically feels like the smallest game Bethesda has ever made, and that's a direct result of so much of the universe being proc gen sludge, and the fact that those tiny islands of handcrafted content are absolutely minuscule with little to no substance. I'm not even saying that procedural generation is a bad thing. I think it can work really well if used with restraint and with enough modifiers to make what it generates feel unique. I view it as more of a scalpel, something to be used with precision and care, as opposed to Bethesda's cluster nuke approach, where they just dump a bunch of shit into the system give some basic parameters and let it fill out their world. To top all this off, there was a hilarious cope defense that real-life astronauts who landed on the moon weren't bored. The plank of wood who made this defense doesn't seem to realize that the first people to leave our planet and land on another celestial body is a far cry from playing a video game. Those astronauts had a job to do and were doing something no man had done before. One is scientific discovery, the other is entertainment. This wasn't done for any attempt at realism, because if it were, that would mean this would be the only aspect of the entire game that even made an attempt at realism. As a reminder as well, this is a company that very clearly doesn't give a shit about realism or even internal consistency. They want to do whatever the fuck they want and not be constrained by the rules of their own worlds, they want to pump out these increasingly lazy and poorly made games and make bank. This is pure laziness and nothing more. As to the realism argument being completely fucked as well, you could take damage from lakes and gas depending on what kind of element they are through your airtight spacesuit. The realism argument falls a bit flat when they don't care about realism in any other aspect of this game. Most of all, I think Bethesda mistakes things to do for actual substantive content. Skyrim, Fallout 4, and now Starfield all suffer from this Radiant Quest problem where they give you extremely basic things to do on loop forever and seem to think that's good enough simply because there's an objective for you to complete, as opposed to a handcrafted quest with a story to tell and characters to meet. During my exploration of random planets in a proc gen area, I found a scientific outpost and they had a quest for me. This quest had me running halfway across the map to a cave to collect a data readout, which I then returned for a reward. 
A very basic and obvious Radiant quest. This hasn't evolved since their introduction with Skyrim, where you'd similarly be told to go to a place and collect a thing, or kill a thing, with little more to it than that. Fallout 4 had the exact same problem. Go to place, collect thing, kill thing, return for reward. The biggest difference between these Radiant quests is the backdrop of a fantasy world, post-apocalypse, or sci-fi universe, but they're still the most basic of fetch and kill quests. The problem is that these quests entirely lack substance. They're mindless tasks for you to complete, with no greater depth than what you see on the surface. This is content they think is worthy of your time, but it's all just generic pointless filler slop. For a point of comparison, Many MMOs, especially World of Warcraft, have daily quests, in which you do the same quest over and over again every day. Sometimes they'll mix them up by having a different selection of daily quests spawn, but regardless, it amounts to doing the same thing over and over and over again. But there's usually still an endpoint or an overarching goal to doing these quests, particularly maxing out reputation with factions and getting access to gear or unique collectible items. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this system is amazing, because it's not. At all. But at least there was still a point to them. There was a goal, and they didn't replace the substantive content of the entire game with them. Radiant Quest quite literally exists purely for the sake of giving you things to do forever and ever with no end, no goal, and no point to them. This garbage content should be rejected whenever it's found to be in a game like this, because it is not a substitute for actual content and was supposed to be a story, character, and faction-driven world. Moving on, naturally much of what you'll be doing in this game is combat, and... I don't know, I can't put my finger on it, but it actually feels worse than Fallout 4 somehow. Even in Fallout 4, I could have a bit of fun shooting things, but it just never felt satisfying to me in Starfield. In fact, I found it to be incredibly boring. The AI seems to be worse. It felt like they mostly just stood there and shot at you, or ran at you with melee weapons. I'll have to look into it more for the full analysis, but I just found it to be really underwhelming and boring. But there's not much else I can say right now. One of the selling points was that you could board and steal ships and add them to your fleet. This feels largely pointless to me. So first of all, you can't really have boarding parties, just you and your companion if you have one. It wasn't clear the first time I tried this, but you actually have to disengage the stolen ship from your own in order to make it your own, and fly it to a planet. The issue is more with the game not explaining that part clearly to me. The real big issue comes when you either want to sell or modify the ship. Now my natural assumption was that you could just sell ships off as a way to make money, or you could find a good ship and modify it to improve it and so forth. Nope, you need to pay a registration fee, which from what I've been able to find is about 85% of the ship's value. Meaning, by extension, that's basically not worth stealing ships for the sake of selling them. Shipbuilding is terrible and I hate it. First of all, there's no tutorial or instruction on how to modify your ships. You're just thrown into the builder to modify things. Once you trial and error your way through that, it's kind of an unwieldy mess. I found it to be time-consuming, unintuitive, and boring. My two biggest issues, however, are what the interiors look like, and a particular error message. First of all, there's this one error message you can get while shipbuilding. Ship contains modules that exceed reactor class. And you might be left thinking, much as I was, what the fuck does that mean? Based on this phrase, I assumed I had parts on my ship that were too powerful for my reactor, which is the power supply of the ship. Turns out I was partially correct. See, the problem was that my piloting skill wasn't good enough for the higher tier reactors, so I simply could not use them. But at the same time, the game didn't make it clear that was the problem I was facing, and additionally, it didn't make it clear which parts I outright cannot use yet due to this. Some parts will be grayed out if you don't have a high enough skill on shipbuilding, but it will not gray out parts that you cannot use yet due to piloting skill being too low. It's ridiculous. As to the other problem, there's little to nothing you can do to customize the interior of your ship. It's all preset objects and layouts. The most you can get is that some pieces will have an option to change to alternate preset interiors, such as storage, weapons locker, captain's cabin, and so forth. 
This means that customization is extremely limited. Worse yet is that you can't even see what these look like from the build menu, meaning you have to build them, exit the build menu, enter your ship and look at them. If you want to change them, you then have to leave your ship and re-enter the build menu. This system is just a convoluted mess all the way around. Finally are the RPG mechanics, which are shallow and annoying. First is traits, which is typically a system that gives a bonus to your character at the cost of being weaker somewhere else. The non-Bethesda Fallout games have good traits to reference here, such as Heavy Handed, which causes melee and unarmed attacks to do 20% more damage, but 60% less critical hit damage, or Small Frame, which grants 1 agility, but limbs take 25% more damage. It's a trade-off that could change the way you play the game. Starfield took this concept and did pretty much nothing with it. A vast majority of the traits available to you are things that should be part of your background. In particular, what religion and faction you associate with. For the factions, you get increased rewards from their quests, but a higher bounty from other factions. For the religion traits, you gain access to a special chest but lose access to the opposing religion's special chest. Aside from those, many are shallow and silly, like the adoring fan one, or the one that lets you meet your character's parents for some reason, or the dream home trait. There's barely any traits that embody how this system is supposed to function, and there's only like one or two traits that are actually good. The rest is either gimmicky bullshit or aspects of character building that should be handled separately, in particular your background. Backgrounds are typically aspects to character building that either have more subtle or lesser effects or they concern things such as faction allegiance or religion. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. The faction and religion traits should all have been a part of your background, as opposed to being traits. This is a complete misfire on Bethesda's part, and shows how absurdly disconnected they are from even basic RPG systems now. Instead, backgrounds are a collection of skills which are stylized as a profession of some sort. Make no mistake, too, these aren't classes. These are just which three starting skills you have by default. And other than what those three skills are, this seems to have little to no impact on the rest of the game as far as I've seen. Worse is whatever your profession is could be at odds with working in a fucking mine at the start of the game. With the most absurd example being a xenobiologist, especially when you take into account that this is a barren rock planet. As for the skills themselves, they've gone with a different system this time. In Skyrim, you leveled up your skills, then picked a perk that did most of the heavy lifting of what the skill itself should do. In Fallout 4, they removed skills entirely and bogged down the perk system with perks that fill out the role of what skills should have done. In The Elder Scrolls, you level up through using your skills. In Fallout, you gain experience through doing things, and leveling up gives you points to raise your skills. Starfield combined these systems in the most obnoxious way possible. While they're called skills, they function more like perks in their presentation. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I do think it speaks to the general dumbing down of RPG mechanics Bethesda has been doing for a very long time now. It's a system almost similar to what Seven Days to Die has, which isn't an RPG, where these skills don't function like typical RPG skills, but more like perks where each level gives a big boost to your ability. In order to rank up your skills, you need to complete certain challenges beyond the first level of the skill, and this was implemented in a very obnoxious way. Some of these challenges are simple. Some just outright cock block you from leveling up your skills and lead to annoying situations. For example, if you want to capture an enemy ship, but your piloting skill is too low, then you're shit out of luck because you can't target their engines yet. To level up your skill, Rather than just putting a point there, you need to complete a challenge of destroying five ships. Once you do that, you can rank up and now target engines to disable their ships and steal them. Now if you want to further upgrade your piloting skill, especially considering some ships and ship parts are locked behind the skill, you have to destroy more ships. Destroy, not disable. This means the actual effectiveness of your piloting is irrelevant. It's purely based on your ability to destroy ships. This includes, by the way, derelict ships that are adrift with no one on them and no autopilot. So expertly disabling and taking an enemy ship doesn't contribute to your piloting skill, but shooting an unmanned ship 
basically the equivalent of walking up to a dartboard and pushing the dart into the bullseye, counts for raising your skill. This feels like a system that someone who has never played an RPG would make when making an RPG. Ultimately, the best thing to come from Starfield is the fact that more people seem to be waking up to what Bethesda is. Starfield wasn't created in a vacuum. This was a long time coming with Bethesda's constant dumbing down and increasing laziness with making their games. The road they've been taking has been obvious for years, and Starfield being a destination shouldn't be shocking to anyone. People like me have been ringing the alarm bells for years, only to be mocked and derided for not mindlessly consuming and praising the likes of Fallout 3, 4, and Skyrim, as if they're God's gift to man. This is exactly why I've been criticizing Bethesda for years, before even making this channel, because I did not want to see them become this. Make no mistake, if this was Elder Scrolls 6 or Fallout 5 that released this year instead, we'd be in a very similar position, because it would have been the same team behind it and the same overall design philosophy. Prior to launch, I was skeptical of the quality of the game based on the Starfield Direct, other pre-release information, and how Bethesda had been reacting, and due to the simple skepticism, I got a lot of shit from people on Twitter, people making some really personal attacks against me for simply questioning if the game would be good, and my Twitter account was even mass flagged into getting permanently banned. And yet, here we are, months later, and I can't help but feel vindicated. Interest in this game fell off a fucking cliff in just a couple weeks. The Starfield videos that seemed to get the most interest are the ones mocking and making fun of it and criticizing its failings. There's little to no actual interest or enthusiasm from people who aren't Bethesda or Xbox fanboys, and once again, it's a good thing I'm late with this review, because while writing the last parts of this script, I found out that Starfield didn't even get fucking nominated for Game of the Year, and didn't win RPG of the Year. I can only hope this is a wake-up call for Bethesda, and I hope they take a step back and learn what went wrong here. Because despite what people say about me due to my criticisms of their games, I don't want Bethesda to fail. I didn't want Starfield to be a bad game. I don't want to look on with dread as the next Elder Scrolls or Fallout games are announced and approach release. I want these games to be good above all else. I love Elder Scrolls and Fallout. I want them to be good. I want to enjoy new Elder Scrolls and Fallout games. But it doesn't feel like we're ever going to get another good game in either series. Starfield is just another step on the path Bethesda has been taken for decades now, slowly but surely stripping out all depth and nuance from their games with each iteration. All the RPG mechanics being removed or reduced and dumbed down, and turning them into vast, empty, mediocre sandboxes to kill generic things in, with stories that are worse than the last, where the only two tenets they follow are to be shocking, for the sake of it, or to be wacky and weird, because that's funny, I guess. It genuinely does not bring me joy to sit here and make a set of videos totaling 14 hours long, criticizing and tearing apart Fallout 4 for being a terrible game, with an abysmal story, an awful world building, and shallow empty characters, and lackluster half-baked mechanics, because there's simply that much wrong with it. Base game only, by the way, not even including the DLC. I wanted Fallout 4 to be good. I wanted Skyrim to be good. I even wanted Starfield to be good. I make the videos I do largely to highlight the issues these games have, so more people will realize them and notice them, and hopefully we'll get better games one day. I hated Amnesia Rebirth so much that I put a video I'd been making on pause to do a video on Amnesia Rebirth. Then a couple years later, Amnesia the Bunker comes out, and it was great. Was I responsible for that change? No, of course not. But for whatever reason, Frictional must have seen what went wrong with Rebirth. They tried damage control with the whole Fear Flash thing that was mocked for being a pathetic cop-out for adding cheap and lazy jump scares to their games, and they came back strong with a game that was really well made overall. That's the kind of comeback I want to see with Bethesda. But we'll never get that if each release they have is praised out the ass due to people mindlessly riding the hype train, or being fanboys who not only will never criticize the thing they're obsessed with, but will actively go out of their way to attack or even try to destroy those critical of the thing they like. Fortunately, the criticism against Starfield does seem to be too big to ignore. Is waiting for to come in, right? 
and then reading the reviews, of course, and hopefully, if you get lucky, ignoring the reviews. <laughs> hopefully. I guess the ball's in Bethesda's court now. Improve the quality of the content of your games and don't rely on endless proc-gen radiant sludge? Or continue making games worse than your last? I'm not going to hold my breath. I have no faith in Bethesda at this point. Fallout 4 only confirmed my suspicion that Bethesda games were getting worse and worse with each iteration, and Starfield only strengthened that belief. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel. I will be back eventually with an in-depth analysis of this game. I've gotten a lot of work done on the script, I've pretty much completed scripting coverage of the main story, and for anyone interested in watching me suffer on stream, I will be streaming my first time through each of the four faction paths. Until then, thank you for watching.